many of you here tonight will be very familiar with the background of the subject that I'm talking about. Some of you might not be. So what I'm trying to do is to pitch this talk somewhere in the middle to also offer up some practical suggestions and techniques for working with the concepts of calling and the inner imaginarium. And I hope that um, all of you will find something new in the evening's discussions somewhere. So I'd like to begin by talking about the concept of calling. What do I mean by that? Well, first of all, I'd just like to draw your attention to a very beautiful old Greek word, many, many beautiful old Greek words, but this one particularly, uh, eudaimonia, which um, means the condition of flourishing or of living well, and particularly of living a life filled with meaning, with blessedness and with connection. And really, I guess in a nutshell, that to me is what calling is about. And before I get started, I should just say that my own background is um, originally in psychology and a little bit later on in mythology. And although initially I was trained in a very strictly scientific psychology paradigm and methodology, in my middle years, I got a bit of a grip and I retrained myself in Jungian and post-Jungian psychology. And a particular influence of mine is uh, James Hillman, one of the founding fathers of what's come to be known as archetypal psychology in a post-Jungian vein. And in his best-selling book, The Soul's Code, In Search of Character and Calling, Hillman declared quite simply, each person enters the world called. Each of us, in other words, has a calling. We came into the world at this particular place, at this particular time, for a purpose, or maybe two purposes, and I'll come back to that a little bit later on. Calling in this sense, it's really important to stress, is neither fate nor destiny in the, the, the way that we normally think of such things. And in my own view, at least, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with your profession or the job that you do. It can, of course, if you happen to fulfill whatever purpose you believe you have in life predominantly through your occupation, through your work. Although this is arguably vocation, which I see as a kind of subset of calling. But for many people, their sense of purpose in the world is expressed by ways of being rather than specifically by ways of doing. Now, Hillman's notion of calling as expressed in his book, of course, was not original. It can be traced back at least as far as Plato, who expressed the idea in his Myth of Air, which is a legend that concludes his book, The Republic. In it, a man called Air dies in battle. To cut a long story short, he comes back to life again, just as he's placed on his funeral pyre, which is a very lucky escape, and he tells the onlookers about the time that he has spent in the preceding days in the afterlife. Now, Er's story suggested that before each of us is born, our soul selects the new life that it will be born into, and also selects a purpose for us to fulfil during our time here on Earth. So Er said that each soul before being incarnated must pass under the throne of the goddess Ananke, whose name means necessity, and she is the mother of the three fates. She is the one, Plato suggested, who helps establish what it is necessary for each soul to do or to be or to become before it enters the world. Your genius will not be allotted to you, but you choose your genius. The souls are told by a kind of interpreter, <clears throat> excuse me, prophet character in the story. You choose your genius. So after this story suggests, after we intend to, what we intend to accomplish has been confirmed, the soul then travels to the plain of oblivion where Letha, the river of forgetfulness, flows. Once we've drunk from its waters, we emerge into our new life completely ignorant of the fate that we've chosen, just to be really helpful. But of course, that is the purpose of the journey. It's to uncover that purpose. It's to live, to be challenged by that uncovering. The good news is that we're accompanied into this life by a diamond, 
a spiritual companion who acts as a kind of carrier of our destiny, as Plato puts it, and helps to ensure that we fulfill it. Now, we're going to come back to the diamond in a moment. But the good news is that although we, we come into this life forgetting the path that we've chosen, we don't come into it alone. There is guidance and there is help out there. And that's what I really want to focus much of the discussion on tonight. So there are many, many interesting threads in this in this lovely old story, but I want to focus really just on this idea of calling and of the choices that we make. Now, Hillman took up these um, ancient ideas and similarly suggesting that before we're born, the soul selects the pattern that it wants to live out. And so we bring into this world and carry inside us an innate vision, a kind of concealed, invisible potential which we are intended to express during the course of our lives. Now, in his book and in his work, Hillman used many different terms for this vision. My favourite, though, my favourite way of imagining this is to think of it as an acorn, because the acorn, like any seed, carries within it the image of and the potential to become the oak tree that it might eventually be, given the circumstances that will allow it to flourish but there is no guarantee that it will. And there is no guarantee with calling. This is a challenge that we face during our lives. That image or um, potential which we carry inside, whatever we might imagine it to be, guides us, prods us, or a collection of images, guides us, prods us, helps us through our life to remember what we're here for. And sooner or later, Hillman believed, and I believe also, something calls us to follow a particular path. And what we must do then is make sure that we make the right choices and that we take the path that aligns our life with our calling rather than another path, which might seem to be the path of least resistance or an easier path. And although this sounds rather fatalistic, Really, it's important to understand that, that what we're working with here is very much a, a potential, not a predetermined pattern. We journey through life in continual moving adjustments, not following some grand predestined design, not following one single path, which if we miss, we've had it. The paths we choose in life will keep on trying to align themselves to our overall purpose or calling. And so, in other words, that journey which will ultimately lead us to fulfill our calling reshapes itself to the choices we make in life. If you don't take the path that aligns with your calling the first time, it'll come around again. It's not going to let you go. You get to choose again. And often it seems to me the things that we think of as errors, where we've kind of fallen off the path when we look back with hindsight, are the things that best equip us in the end for the path of our calling. We're always going to be faced with choices that can align us with our calling. The world never gives up on us. So what we're supposed to do when we um, are called onto a particular path or to make a particular choice in our lives is first of all, ask ourselves whether this feels like a true path, whether this feels to us like a path which we intuitively sense is aligned with our calling. If it is, then we align our lives to it. It's also, as I've said, important to understand that, that accidents, heartaches, really challenging periods in our life belong to the pattern of our calling and are there to help us fulfill it. Now, not everyone comes to their calling early in life, and I'm not really sure that it matters. Uh, when I work with these ideas and workshops and retreats that I run, I often find that surprisingly young people um, are distressed by the idea that they haven't yet understood what their calling might be, as if calling were a kind of destination that you needed to arrive at as soon as possible, rather than um, a lifelong journey to fulfill your greatest potential, which I believe it is. And I think that that sense of a, a desperate race to kind of figure it all out as soon as you can is surely a reflection of modern culture a culture which tells us constantly that the fastest solutions are the best. Uh, and who has the time these days to do the research, to learn, to reflect, to make a mistake? We're all a little bit like Alice's white rabbit. We constantly imagine ourselves to be running late for the rest of our lives. Um, 
so it's really important, I think, when we think about our soul journeys, about this journey of calling, not to beat ourselves up for the times when hindsight allows us to understand that we might have taken a path which wasn't aligned with our calling. I should also say that for me, calling doesn't have anything to do necessarily with any specific religious beliefs. It, it's quite simply for me the work of a lifetime. It's about living life as if it mattered. It's beautiful work, I think, because it's not so much about doing and accomplishing as it is about developing and expressing a vision for your life. And one of the things that's forgotten in a task driven culture, which has no appreciation of calling, is that developing a vision takes time. Sometimes it takes a lifetime for it to emerge uh, and for it then to be developed and expressed in all of the ways that are, that are possible for us. Because I think to express our calling is to allow ourselves to uniquely express one mode of being, one creative um, facet of um, one facet of the creative life of the universe, whatever you might conceive that to be. And the one notion about calling that I, I always like to stress above all is that I believe it tells us this idea that we're here, you know, for a purpose to express something in our lives. I believe it tells us that we're not here to be safe. We're here to risk everything. We didn't come here for the purpose which contemporary Western society seems to want us to believe that we're here for, to accumulate sufficient wealth so that we can retire from what, um, at the age of 60 or thereabouts, if we're lucky, to a nice house and a nice safe neighbourhood, if we're lucky, uh, to stop work and play golf, if we're lucky, or to go on round the world cruises and wait to die. And, and it's not that we shouldn't hope for safety and pleasure in our lives, but these things shouldn't be our primary motivation. That's what this concept of calling tells us. We're here to risk everything to fulfill that innate vision that we brought with us into this life and to walk wholeheartedly along the path which leads us there, even if that path is sometimes dangerous or hard. <laughs>